a claim over that property uh, you know because it, it's put in place those mechanisms so in a sense uh, the registration record is now sort of pulling ahead of the land record uh, you you are creating a, a check so that the sub registrar can uh, verify these things which was earlier not in place and as i'll tell you is also legally not required of the sub registrar so if you look at uh, section 34 of the registration act which uh, lays down what sort of the bounds of uh, the enquiries that a sub registrar can make during registration he can basically uh, you know verify the mental state of the parties verify whether uh, the executants are the same as uh, you know the ones who are standing in front of him and uh, you know stamp duty has been paid uh, that sort of thing but cannot really go into whether uh, this person who is conveying this property to the other person uh, has a title over that property but uh, because i sarita uh, has put in place these linkages whereby uh, uh, the 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 sub registrar can view the land record before going ahead with registration he can take a look at you know is this guy who's selling the property is his name there as uh, you know the primary holder of this property and uh, also in many other instances for example even equitable mortgages uh, have been linked uh, with the sro's office through uh, an application called e filing equitable mortgages uh, for those who don't know is uh, mortgages by deposit of title deeds there's no paperwork involved you basically go deposit your title deeds with the bank they give you a loan uh, but now in maharashtra they've passed an amendment uh, saying that the notice of an equitable mortgage needs to be sent to the registrar's office so those are things that they are now aware of so in a in a sense a, a sub registrar can uh, <coughs> sort of do a check of course there are many other linkages uh, that are required for this to be completely operational for example you may need a linkage uh, with uh, the database of courts uh, to understand whether this property has been attached by a court and you know so if you know if, if that is the case then uh, the sub registrar can put a stop to the transaction right there right but uh, those uh, linkages haven't been uh, sort of in place yet i'll talk about the linkage which has uh, come in place that's this one that mahabulek is uh, the name of um, the application which the maharashtra government has given to uh, its database which stores its online rural records uh, the if you see the 7/12 that's the sat bara sat bara is what the rural revenue record is called in maharashtra and uh, so the way that isarita works right now is if you are going to do uh, a you know a registration of a transaction of sale or uh, actually it's for five kinds of transactions and for any of those five uh, transactions if you go to an sro and uh, what he has to do uh, while using the isarita software is he has to view the sat bara which is the rural record and the details from the sat bara are automatically extracted and put into the isarita software or uh, uh, and uh, you know by that extension they get put into uh, the sort of registration process right now uh, it is possible for the sub registrar to manually uh, sort of alter that if he so wishes but i think uh, you know as more versions of the software come about uh, they'll stop um, yeah the use um, or, or the that that window for the sub registrar to make those manual alterations uh, so this functions basically this functions is a verification of the uh, you know the seller's claim on the property even though this is beyond as i mentioned it's beyond the sub registrar's legal uh, you know bounds so in many ways the the technology is uh, pulling way ahead of the law which is usually the case with technology but uh, you know um, so if if at all this argument of uh, the registration record becoming a proxy to the land record becoming more comprehensive than the land record is to come true then you know you would have to have suitable amendments to the registration act of course but uh, it's not something that i have to consider so i can make that argument uh yeah the other thing is the e mutation now this is something uh, which is got to do with the automatic updating of the land records once the registration happens 
so in the isarita itself uh, once the sub registrar has viewed uh, the satbara or the rural land record once he's picked that option it automatically triggers the online uh, mutation otherwise what happens physically is that once the registration is complete you have to go to the land records office which is atalati patwari by whatever name uh, you may know him uh, you have to go there you have to apply uh, for uh, updating your land record once uh, this is in place once the immutation uh, happens you don't have to do any of that uh, it automatically triggers once the registration is done it automatically sends a request for mutation uh, and uh, yeah actually this is not very relevant to this argument it's relevant to the sense okay so e registration is the next generation of uh, the isarita software what this basically proposes is that you don't have to come to the registrar's office at all you can do your registration sitting wherever it uses your aadhar card as your id and uh, it's right now being used only for first time sale of flats and license agreements leave in license agreements uh, these have basically been chosen because they are low risk in high volume transactions uh, they are low risk because you don't have to verify the title uh, for a first time sale of flat because uh, the idea is that it's a clean title that you're uh, you know giving out uh, it's worth mentioning here because uh, the records that are created out of this uh, you can be sure that they they have clean title uh, so yeah that's about it i mean uh, so i'll just sum up some of the reasons why i think uh, the registration record uh, is is going to pull ahead of uh, the land record uh one is that the digitization of the registration records has sort of outpaced the digitization of land records by a huge uh, margin so if you look at maharashtra itself in bombay uh 100% of uh, the registration records for the last 30 years have been digitized in uh, the rest of the states it's about 83% but they'll get to 100 pretty soon and uh for certain kinds of properties especially vertical properties in india you have land records for survey numbers so if you have a flat you may not uh, see it reflected in your land record individually but a registration record is basically for all kinds of property so even the vertical property will get reflected in the registration record and that is something that's not possible in the land record as it stands uh the other thing is uh, since um, you know one of the chief stumbling blocks for the registration records is that the sro uh, you know earlier did not have to verify uh, who the sort of the the title holder is but now with the capacity being built with isarita the sro can do that and hence i feel like the registration record in many senses is uh, you know way more comprehensive and shows a much truer picture of uh, what is reflected on the ground and that's why it's something worth considering yeah thanks No, I'll, I'll just use this. Um, sure, just, just hello. Just give me a few seconds to settle in and change the presentation before we begin. Don't count this as my time, please. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. Yes. Thank you. One. I'll put this here. Hello. Let's go this way. Yeah. Let's go somewhere again. Got you open. Okay. Yeah, it's much easier in life. Yeah. Wonderful. So, um, as all of us can see, my presentation is not a case study. It's uh, rather um, a paper that looks at blockchain technology and examines whether the same can be applied to India, right? So, blockchain is like a new shiny toy for humanity, which seems to provide a solution to one basic fundamental problem of uh, the market, right? Which is intermediaries, right? So, it it aims at enabling humanity with this. one tool that will break down the shared fiction of corporate control over affairs so in this paper in this brief 10 minutes that we have and i have forgotten to turn on my timer in the brief 10 minutes that we have uh, we shall be looking at what blockchain is right so it it as a new solution as technology um um we shall be looking at the uses of blockchain the application of blockchain um then we shall be looking at with how blockchain can be applied to property registration followed by an examination of land record modernization in india and finally looking at the challenges to using blockchain in india right so five parts necessarily the limitation so several papers around this have been written in india itself around how blockchain can help yada 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 but the 
thing that this pro paper proposes to do, and hence its limitation also, is that it's limited to land records. It's not talking about digital identity, it's not talking about privacy, it's not talking about infrastructure. It's talking solely about land records. Right, so blockchain technology, you have a hundred work explanation by Richard Bradley, but I shall be uh, giving a definition uh, uh, simultaneously, right? So what is blockchain? Blockchain utilizes something called a distributed ledger. Now, a distributed ledger is a ledger which is simultaneously shared between various nodes. Nodes are computers on a system, right? Now, when a transaction happens on this node, it simultaneously happens uh, on this ledger, it simultaneously happens with every node. Once a transaction has happened and a block is formed, this block is then verified by all the nodes, encrypted using what is called a cryptographic graphic, graphic hash, and then this hash is the uh, and this node, uh, block is sealed and presented, right? So this hash is functions like a key to a block. Uh, it necessarily cannot be used to decrypt the block, but it can be used to verify the block, right? So a simple diagram, if you guys want to see like how it functions, we'll give you ten seconds for going through this. Yeah, so essentially, you have data, nodes, all nodes see it, verify it, encrypt it by a cryptographic hash, a mathematic algorithm, and then you have the transactions completed and a block formed. Right, so the applications of blockchain technology have been to various things. Uh, we all know about cryptocurrency, right? Bitcoins. Uh, for example, Bitcoins today morning uh, was valued at $14,882 with a market capitalization of $249.9 uh, billion. So interestingly, five minutes later, it was 13,000 something. So it also talks about the volatility. Of, of, of something like a digital currency. But what blockchain did was eliminate the one functional problem with digital currencies, which is that of double spending. Why? Because it provides us the verifiability, the authenticity of that record. Interestingly, what has also been used, uh, blo what uh, blockchain technology has also been used for is humanitarian reasons, right? So for example, in 2017, UN WFP uh, sent cryptographic vouchers, uh, vouchers of cryptographic money to 10,000 Syrian ref refugees, which was based on Ethereum system and could be used by them to buy food. Similarly, the United Nations plus the World Identity Network is currently building a project where they will use digital identity to track child, uh, to combat child, tra tra child trafficking and tackle the problem of invisible children. So you see it using, being used by different people and providing legitimacy. What we are concerned about here is property rights, right? So um, something has happened to this slide in transition, my fault, much like the land registry in Honduras when blockchain was applied to it, but necessarily we shall move on to the presentation, right? So how, what does blockchain does for property right? Now again, simple solution, what will it do? It will move the land registry into this wonderful scenario where it's a simultaneous, synchronized, uh, verified land registry which is available to everyone accessing the system, hence you have access to it. Um, you have uh, authenticity of the record and you have access, accuracy of the record, right? What also is beneficial here is that you can use something called smart contracts. Smart contracts are simple technological implements which can carry out smaller legal transactions on, the, on their own, right? So for example, a signature being affixed if uh, checkbox A, B, and C are ticked correct. Now, um, now what a so, so what a blockchain-based registry assures us is ease of access, authenticity, Ease of transaction and then enables us uh, a, a, a smart contract, right? Now, governments like those of Georgia, Ukraine, Sweden, Honduras have already used blockchain, and the state of Vermont is currently, currently uh, in experimenting with it, right? And the goals always have been to improve trustworthiness of records. Remember the three uh, points being reliability accuracy and authenticity and provide uh, pr easing transactions that happen simultaneously on it, right? So we shall cover two um, countries before we move on to examining blockchain in India, right? So Georgia does this very interesting thing, right? Georgia is a former Soviet Union, 1991 independence, um, ranks high in, in terms of its registry, fourth best of the world in 2018. Now what Georgia has done is that it has two blockchains, right? So blockchains um, uh, regist blockchain registries can either be private or public. Now, what is the difference between them? A private blockchain is maintained amongst a regulated certain number of nodes, right? So, out of say, say in A to Z, M to X will have will be maintaining the blockchain registry, and hence it's a private registry. Whereas the rest of them, A to M and X to Z, along with M to X, will have access to the blockchain. A public blockchain, on the other hand, is accessed by everyone and also utilized by everyone, right? So a node is simultaneously uh, a person who's accessing and uh, editing it. 
So Georgia has a dual uh, blockchain system where uh, its private uh, blockchain registry holds the documents. So all your land related records, information documents are held on their private registry. And the public registry that they use is Bitcoin. Because remember, Bitcoin is the largest blockchain that we have. It's the most legitimate, the most immutable to, uh, to, to corruption, right? So it, it puts the hash signatures on the public blockchain, which is Bitcoin, for people to access and verify. Sweden, on the other hand, doesn't do anything radical. Sweden has a wonderful and a beautiful land registry functioning till since some 1684, beautifully maintained. What Sweden does is blockchain has been implemented on its registry, right? So it gets different parties from realtors to banks to government to record actions on a private permission blockchain shared between various, various stockholders, right? So just an implementation, right? Now we go on to land records in India modernization. Well, we'll talk about why land records in India modernization later. But necessarily, so we have already, uh, um, um, Deepika and Varun told you about some aspects of land records in India, the problems with land records in Malina modernization, right? So the aim necessarily since uh, NLRMP, NL, NLRMP has been to to, to move towards conclusive titles, right, to immutable, immutable properties. But necessarily, with these steps, uh, as the government has taken them in the states, you know, Deepika talked about the peculiar federal legislative structure, where necessarily, though we are, we have a central government, land is regulated by states, different schemes, different functioning uh, scenarios, there have been several complications here, right? And I'm not going to go through each of these, but I'll return to them when we apply blockchain to India and see how it functions. Right, so blockchain and India, right? And I have three minutes, wonderful. So now it's always important to remember that what, what does blockchain do? Oh, I have two minutes, oh dear. So uh, what blockchain does is it doesn't replace. Blockchain cannot be your land registry. Blockchain enhances it, right? So the, and, so the, and, and we'll, we'll begin from there, right? So what blockchain needs the database and what are the problems in India with the database? Necessarily, we're dealing with the urban here. As Deepika mentioned, we do not have an urban land registry in several places, right? So for example, we have property cards in say certain parts of Maharashtra, or Bombay or Karnataka, but large parts of India have been concerned about rural property, not urban property, right? Urbanism as a concept is, being ga is garnering force in India since a recent time, but necessarily we do not have a database to start with, right? Uh, the other issues that are there is that, see, blockchain does not formalize informal properties. Your formalization of informal properties necessarily needs to happen by legal procedures that are already existing outside the blockchain system, outside a land registry, right? So you, so, and, and like yesterday we were in discussion about how, uh, like, on, 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 on average, you can consider a third of our Indian cities to be informal. What happens to them? Do they not enter the system? If blockchain land registry is the only land registry functioning, then they're completely thrown out of the system. Another thing, as we talked about, remember, it needs a database for itself. It does not correct erroneous existing records. Because if there is an incorrect record they got in from the very beginning, if Varun owns land, but I have been occupying it and my name is there on it, and that gets in, blockchain is not going to correct it. Those claims still have to be litigated upon, right? And furthermore, I have to update the registry. The registry will not update itself. Problems which are inherent to the land registry that we have ourselves, right? So let us look at some notable factors uh, with blockchain, right? So state of land registry. Now the state of land registry is, is variegated across places, right? So we'll use the EODB rankings here, much fault with their own or not, I don't know, different ideas about how we consider them. But necessarily the only, one of the only few pieces that allow us some form of comparison across, across countries, right? So Sweden um, and Georgia, where necessarily they have been implemented properly, blockchain, rank as the ninth and the fourth best land registries in the world, right? Honduras, where uh, it didn't work, is ranked as 91. India is 154. Uh, on, on the transparency index, which, is, uh, which measures corruption across countries, another problem that blockchain tries to solve is uh, Sweden is 88 out of 100, which is a cleaner state, all right? 100 is clean, zero is unclean. Uh, Honduras is 30, India is 40. Um, similarly, now, now why am I quoting these? Because, why am I quoting Honduras? Because Honduras is a, is a country that is so alike ours in terms of the land registry. And when blockchain was applied to it, it failed, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll close this with, with just comparing Honduras and India and then going. Um, now necessarily, 
we do not have uh, we do not have a land register. We have several land registries in different states, right? Now our land registries are not integrated, which means uh, yeah, I'll just take one more minute. I'm sorry for the extension of time. Um, our land registries, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm breaking what Solomon Solly promised us all, but yeah, now our land registries are not integrated, which means our cadastral and our um, uh, registration uh, based systems necessarily are not linked right registry and cadastral units are not linked much less have common unique identifiers for each of them right so you do not have anything to start with um, then we have uh, I'm not going to talk about corruption political right so but but coverage and extent of land records I've already talked about how we do not have urban records covering it institutional and legal systems right uh, we have a multiplicity of institutions that fun function in urban areas, right? So as the joke goes, a simple street lamp in uh, Delhi could be claimed by 14 different institutions. Now these are legal, institutional legal claims that can be replaced on properties. But what about legal claims by, by citizens, right? You, again, you have a multiplicity of legal claims variegated by not only yourself, but your class and your class and your status in the society, right? So for example, in Bihar, as Deepika rightly mentioned, um, the institutions are still concerned with land reforms. Uh, I mean, th that's their uh, idea because necessarily caste structure is so inherently controlling of the land there that you cannot move beyond it. You need to rectify that first. Similarly, in several parts of India, like the East and, East and Northeast, you have claims onto land uh, like forest rights and tribal uh, rights customary laws that are regulated within a wholly different uh, system which, which Western recognition of land rights cannot necessarily comprehend much less uh, account for, right? So these are issues that we deal with India before we can think about uh, having a, um, uh, a having a blockchain level land register system. Now, I do not have a conclusion because necessarily this is inconclusive. Um, Ukraine is still trying it out and we don't know how it goes. We could try it to fail and waste our money, but necessarily it would be beneficial to first do what we have been doing and what Deepak will talk about before we aim to like, you know, do things that are fanciful and one-step solutions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for it. <laughs> After that very passionate espousal of um, not taking technology too much at face value, let me um, bring us around to the other point of view too. A lot of what um, uh, the paper set out to do has been, in a sense, explained in the course of my colleagues' presentations. I'm just going to concentrate on two or three things. One, what is the rationale of integrating databases? How does it come about? What makes it happen in India? And where are we? And what are the challenges or concerns today? So the rationale of the initial digitization of land records, and this begins with textual records, is very simple. It is to gain from what computerization was understood by many of us who grew with computerization in the 1980s and early 1990s, which is very simple, that this will reduce redundant work because it enables storage and retrieval of data very easily. So that's exactly what was the initial idea of computerizing land records. That there's this big data sets of ownership, etc., records. If we can put it onto a computer, it gets stored there, it can get distributed in different machines, and it can be possible to get, take copies at, on different machines. Reduces the redundant work of people writing it by hand, which is what records were always written by hand, and copies had to be made by hand no longer necessary. It was an easy, it's easy to comprehend the next stage, which is if I've done, I've put a one-time record onto a, da uh, a database, onto a machine, I have to figure out a way of updating it so that the updation takes place easily. Otherwise, I'll end up writing the record all over again. So first, software looks at how records can be updated easily. And the next stage is to see how can I integrate databases which will automatically upgrade the, update the record. I don't have to physically, manually start updating records. So as Deepika and my colleagues have explained, that the key records which are seen as key to property records in India have for a long time been seen as textual record described as Jamabandi, Satbara, etc. 
the spatial record of cad cadastral maps and the registration deeds. So the initial effort therefore is on how to integrate these three. Both from a perspective as Deepika said of reducing inaccuracies or inconsistencies <coughs> but more important in being able, able to update the record in a automatic fashion very quickly and that's what the programs then concentrated on, concentrate on in bringing these together. This process in a sense as Varun says technology, he says technology overtakes and is moves ahead. The need for technology in a sense or understanding of what needs to happen overtakes what is actually happening in 2008 when you announce and say that conclusive titling is now my goal in digitizing records. While I say on the one hand that conclusive titling is my goal, there are enormous limitations to bringing about conclusive titling in India, but at the moment I'm just restricting myself to say that we also, our programs don't comprehend what it, it really involves in terms of integration. We are still focused on integrating registration databases with textual record and spatial databases with the textual and registration records. We don't realize what conclusive titling means in terms of integrating more databases. Because what does conclusive, conclusive titling really mean? Conclusive titling means that I am saying that there is one unique database and that database is final. So what is incorporated in that database is true. If someone comes forward and says, no, this is wrong, then that person cannot alter that database. If they prove that it is wrong, they can be compensated. But the database cannot change. It is final. Draconian, no? So if it is so draconian, it must be really correct. Otherwise, I cannot implement it. I cannot say this is final. Since it is carrying a guarantee that what is carried in the record is final and I will only compensate a person who can say that this is wrong, it must therefore be really correct. And therefore that introduces the need for an intermediate stage for any conclusive titling effort which we call a comprehensive, accurate, real-time updation of the record. There may be lots of differences and debates in India about whether conclusive titling can be introduced, whether blockchains will bring this about, and rightly Deepankar has point, pointed out the, the, the limitations of any such efforts, and we could equally point out the limitations on conclusive titling, despite Government of India's reports on these matters. But the key is that if I say that I need a comprehensive updated, uh, a comprehensive record with more and more accuracy in it, updated in real time, nobody can have a difference of opinion on it. And that requires integrating databases. And that is, what are the kind of databases which we need to integrate to bring about a more comprehensive updated record? We've analyzed that in a sense, a record must, a property record must encompass five areas, five parameters, ownership, possession, land use, extent or area of the property and encumbrances or restrictions or conditions it carries. This last bit, not often understood, is probably one of the most critical because this is where all your informality comes in. All that concerns rights activists, etc. comes in here. If I don't record it, fighting for those rights becomes really difficult. So encumbrances of every kind, whether customary rights, whether rights acquired in the course of time, rights acquired by squatting, etc. How can I bring these about? How do I bring these databases together? So the real challenge in integrating databases today is to think about the databases which can bring about a more comprehensive, updated picture and then think of ways to bring about that integration. So for ownership, for example, we've shortlisted that across the country, we probably need to think of how to integrate birth and death registration with land record databases. 
because that brings about the big, the, the whole today, after I've integrated registration databases, which cover approximately 70% of transactions in relation to land, is succession, which covers anywhere from 20 to 30% of transactions, of events, which result in a change in the record. So I need to bring about those integration. On possession, Maharashtra has shown the way, and it says all rent agreements must be registered. In a sense, it's bringing that, it's bringing the possibility by a legal change of bringing that into the record, a database which can then be incorporated in the record. Most states don't have that. We need to bring about possibly those, advocate bringing about those legal changes. Land use. There is a mindset which says that if I incorporate an informal changed land use into the record, I will legalize something which I don't want to. That's, it's something which my land use laws do not allow, and therefore if I incorporate it into the record, it confers a certain legality to something which I don't want to convert. Now that requires a complete mindset change, that if I want to create a comprehensive updated picture, which is a mirror of the real-time situation, then I have to go beyond this, this legality mindset and say the legality needs to be the legality or illegality of an action needs to be tackled elsewhere. The record is only a picture. Can I bring about this mindset? Mindset, that's the challenge. Because if I can, if I can link current satellite-based mapping, mapping applications with all their data updated in real time with my records, I can create much clearer pictures already. Not a difficult proposition technologically, difficult proposition on the legal sphere and the mindset behavior issues. So encumbrances is even bigger. It's a question of linking court softwares because disputes is the biggest area of encumbrance which we need to record because that has implications for future transactions. If, as, as Deepika mentioned, our whole registration system is a caveat emptor system. Let the buyer beware. So if I can tell the buyer this property already has an encumbrance in terms of existing disputes on it, I may be preventing a further transaction and further dispute on it. So those are soft, uh, databases I need to link, whether it is court software uh, databases, it is databases on land use, which, which are imposing conditions, it's databases on, in whatever form I have gathered on informality, in different ways of different rights, those need to be brought together if I need to bring about this picture. I'll end by saying, so the challenges are both the visualization challenges, the challenge of, I must mention, it's taken us 30 years and we are still not integrated, that initial integration of textual, spatial and registration. And the programs have been in place for 30 years. There is a huge motivational gap there's a huge envisioning gap. There's a huge prioritization gap of thinking about these issues. That has to be tackled first. But there's also the gap of concern. Are we going to create a, a state with even more data, which we are already concerned about what it can do with this? It's a concern which remains. And it's, it's a concern like the larger concern on Aadhaar, which we'll have to look at if we think that this is something which needs addressing. Meanwhile, I think we need to go ahead and integrate because it's going to really impact the quality of our lives if we can reduce the number of disputes on property. Thank you. I just had three things to add to, yeah, Amlan Goswami, IHS. Uh, I work with panelists. Uh, I had three points to add to uh, what was mentioned. Um, first, I'm a student of law and politics, sociology, not of technology, so I guess it shows in what I'm trying to say. Uh, the first is that the states, uh, um, 
interest, fascination, obsession with uh, managing, knowing more about land and property is not a new one. It is, it goes back all the way. Uh, so, uh, in law, control over territory is an essential element of sovereignty. So, if you are a country, then it's one of the most fundamental premises of law. Very good to think about it when you're thinking blockchain, which is kind of pan, pan state, spans jurisdictions, pan regulation, uh, regulatory authorities, etc. Uh, as an example, for example, uh, the settlement systems that we have in India today uh, have not changed much for the last 450 years uh, since Todarmal. So Todarmal was Akbar's finance minister. Uh, he introduced the servant settlement methods, the way we understand what the bigha is, what the basic classifications are. Uh, they haven't really changed much. Of course, then the colonial kind of British administration rationalized them a little further. But mind you, they didn't really tamper with or kind of dispose of Todermal's uh, system, which also explains that administrators have also been sensitive to uh, the way land relations happen on the ground. In other words, have been loath to impose new classificatory systems uh, for multiple reasons, while the state is very keen to retain monopoly over its uh, suzerainty over land, so to speak. The monopoly is also explained also because the state gets revenue out of land. So earlier it was land revenue, right from you know, time, whatever, 500, 600 years ago, uh, to, uh, to now when we're talking about municipal taxation systems and so on, transaction systems, registration charges, stamp duty, etc. So the revenue element incentive remains for states. It's an important part of why state is using technology to kind of map databases, get stuff around. <coughs> the third being the obvious that the state being the, having monopoly over, over force. I mean, societal compact is such that the state has monopoly over use of force. Uh, otherwise, we won't have a society which works. Uh, the, the flip side is that the state is also supposed to be the custodian of orderly social and political relations. So, i.e. disputes, i.e. Uh, various forms of land use, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, the state remains the custodian or the arbiter, so to speak, of, of this. That was my first. What is the role of the state here? The second thing was an observation coming from all these things, uh, presentations is one could perhaps club uh, these technological kind of uh, the linearity of technology since the 80s, when this kind of really became a big thing, uh, into perhaps three generations. That's just my kind of sense of things. The first generation being the 80s, uh, uh, which is basically about digitization and computerization, i.e. the paper stuff, which is tattered, not quite up to date, illegible, etc., etc., needs to be put in some kind of digitized format, as for the reasons Deepak has already explained. Uh, also, go back in time to history to the technology mission, Sam Petroda, all of that going on at that time. So, that, that gives you a sense of, so like land was just one part of the deal. Second is increasingly from the, since the McKinsey report of 2001, which basically said that because our property markets are kind of dysfunctional, we need to clean up land, land records and property records. Since then, a push towards culminating in the 2008 government, central government scheme, which decided to give money, even though the st center doesn't legislate on land, uh, but the center can incentivize change of behavior, so to speak. So the center in 2008 decided to incentivize change of behavior by advocating what was the conclusive system uh, and said India is very far from it. Now here is, and for technology purposes, the three very important elements of this, uh, which is otherwise known as a torrent system. One is mirror, which is why this Deepak's point on integrating databases to reflect on the ground reality, which is the mirror, which the mirror I see should be the, what, I, what, is, what exists. So technology has been the kind of at the forefront of this push towards uh, saying that the reality will mirror the land record system. So that's the first peg. The second is a very interesting peg called curtain. And curtain means that you're going to draw a curtain literally over all previous transactions. Because you trust the mirror and the technology so much to sort your stuff out, you could, as Deepika said, for example, in Gujarat, they decided to do a resurvey and decided not to look at the old stuff anymore. I.e., that you trust the technology system to do a mirror and then you draw a curtain and say all, everything will be a blank kind of new tabula rasa, so to speak. So the past being obliterated, it's got stuff to do with technology, modernism, etc. And once you've done mirror and curtain, the state indemnifies the buyer in case of any problems, discrepant information regarding the same. 
So this looks very nice on paper, saying that, oh, the state will, will provide insurance for this. There'll be, you know, every buyer is protected, et cetera, et cetera. However, this is not easy to, fu 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 to fulfill for the reasons Deepika, Deepankar, Varun, Deepak have already illustrated. But I thought this was the second part of it, which is a question of oh, things are not matching. We digitized it, put it on paper, put the paper on computer, but it's not matching. We need to do something about matching because mirror has to happen, curtain has to happen. The third generation, which I think we're already seeing now, is this question of interfaces, is the question of more interactive forms of technology, either represented in blockchain stuff or in Deepak stuff of, you know, let's put the stuff together in a real-time kind of format in some ways. If these are three generations of of, in terms of technological move, the interesting thing is they are not, they don't clearly kind of match on to what's happening on the ground. In other words, all the three generations are overlapping at a given point of time at a given place. So if you ask, depending on who you ask, some people will say, no, our, our tattered paper maps are still tattered and we are not being, so you'll have a, so, so in other words, the linear flow of technology gets disrupted by what's going on actually, because that is, because the ground reality is very different. Second, political economy, which is basically settlement system, settlement histories, whether you are Zamindari system, permanent settlement, Royatwari, Mahalwari, whatever, what have you, which the state has kind of superimposed, and technology has superimposed further on that, that kind of continually intervenes, and because that's, so you have a very kind of complicated system where on one hand the technology champions are evangelizing new versions, so to speak, new smartphone type kind of effort, uses an analogy, and, and that each new version is a possible new utopia, uh, however, you are encountering the reality of political economy, state center, institutional bureaucracy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which does not quite tally with the three things going together. Interesting thing to notice: that all the th things are also happening at the same time. So, blockchain conversations are happening right now, just as the old conversations of "Oh, my map is not working." So, Patwaris are saying, "I am just going to WhatsApp the map because nobody is digitizing it. I am going to use that WhatsApp thing as a possible way of kind of." of credible kind of information. That's happening in Rajasthan, for example. So I thought this was an interesting kind of technology society fix question. The third and the last is that it's a legitimacy question for the state as well as for people around it. And I think increasingly as in a democratic setup, the legitimacy question is not an irrelevant question. So depending on who the buyers, who are the kind of people who are, cha who are championing this. Uh, for example, that will explain why, say, in Gujarat, uh, big land reform or land modernization push uh, efforts happen post-elections and not pre-elections. Because if you have pre-election, you have lots of disruption, you'll have lots of dis disputes, and that will play around with you know, all kinds of things which are otherwise linked to Patidar, Patel, etc. So the state is concerned about legitimacy. One way I, I felt was stuff was happening is that where the citizen is a consumer of the land record, in a way of making it more accessible. In other words, one way to build legitimacy is to say that stuff is made more accessible to the citizen. I can, for example, a citizen without contacts, without calling up people, can look into my phone or computer as the case may be and find any kind of uh, relevant information relating to that plot of land or property. So in Himachal, for example, you have Lokmitra Kendras, citizen service centers, where information is readily available. Where the citizen is a consumer of such accessible information, the state has more, the state gives such legitimacy to such projects. In other words, uh, there is more legitimacy attached to, 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 uh, uh, to, that, to that. However, where the citizen becomes a producer of that data and not a consumer of that data. In other words, where the citizen is roaming around with GPS devices on the ground and saying, I'm going to like record all this, uh, or in a slightly more complicated way, a blockchain kind of thing. Uh, there, however, the sense of legitimacy from the state is far less. Because the state will say, you guys don't know what you're doing, frankly. We have the record. We want a more updated record. Um, and this level of legitimacy also depends on uh, the levels of acceptance within the state, the bureaucracy. For example, uh, the lower bureaucracy will perhaps think differently from the higher bureaucracy. So higher bureaucracy, I mean IS officers who otherwise know the policy initiatives in, in the center, etc. And the lower bureau bureaucracy knows the realities on the ground better, if not the policy uh, better. So the levels of, in, of acceptance, legitimacy also depend on who you're talking to within the state. Uh, uh, and, and the new kind of, and the other part about this, which is kind of an unaddressed question on legitimacy itself is, is that the judiciary is not bought into this at all. They're on their own kind of uh, 
you know, whatever it is, presumptive kind of thing. So, uh, so you always have a kind of parallel track thing going on. This track thing is not, while it is, um, while every new initiative of the center or the state proposes a new form of technology as a supposed solution to the old stuff, uh, it is not as if um, all of it has the same level of legitimacy or acceptance uh, and therefore results on the ground start showing different kind of uh, uh, differences. Uh, I think that's, that's the reason I think we find it a very interesting way of you know, looking at things. Uh, just as we find it very difficult to propose particular solutions despite that. So, thanks. Uh, we'll now open it up to uh, the floor. Thank you. Uh, the flow, which, and you might have noticed that uh, what Amlan has metaphorically, metaphorically shown is what happens on land, because this was supposed to be the panel and he's uh, very much part of it now. So it's just like what we talked about where land gets occupied in different ways and that's part of life. It's just a sort of humorous <laughs> introduction to the whole thing. <laughs> that's perfectly fine. <laughs> so let's have some more questions. There's one over there and then uh, let's take two more and then <coughs> have a response, including <coughs> from Amlan. So that's okay. <laughs> So um, this was a very interesting panel, and uh, this debate, uh, this debate about uh, introduction of technology into these us while uh, uh, manually uh, recorded areas. So uh, a similar kind of debate, like it resonates to uh, the uh, with 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 the with the area where I come from, like from in the from the infrastructures perspective. So, uh, the debate about exclusion and inclusion uh, uh, with the introduction of technology. So, as uh, I think Deepika talked about the Bihar case, so the government is a bit apprehensive of, of, of this technology because, because it, it, it fears that it might derail its uh, agenda of land reforms. Similarly, uh, when it comes to infrastructures, uh, so there have been there has been recent debate about uh, the leakages in the infrastructure basically enable s certain groups of people to actually access them. Uh, so I I just want you to reflect upon it in this aspect. Thank you. Let's take two more. I think there were some more hands uh, over here. There's one there and then one. Thank you, first of all, for the whole array of possibilities of looking at this topic. Uh, the question is rather um, just to understand the meaning or the connotations that are associated with land as a resource. So it started with uh, almost discussing land almost being compared to a commodity or that which is quite physical and rooted in the way we discussed where we just have the spatial maps which are actually tracking the land and all that and slowly with the technology taking over and uh, saying that online registration is possible it's not just in terms of retrieving data that we were trying to shift to you uh, use technology but also probably one who's not in that place and still can own the land or these kind of things which might come up with uh, technology taking over land things. So somewhere I felt that uh, land, our understanding of the land is shifting towards it being a sort of liquid commodity from the physical. So the question is that with this changing uh, transition in the understanding of what land is as a resource, uh, two, two, two things. Uh, could architects actually uh, intervene in uh, dealing with this? How could architects actually intervene with dealing with this? Because eventually we are the ones fighting with uh, uh, how do we create the overall urban experience and things like that. And the other one is uh, how do you think architects should understand uh, this sort of a transition which is happening so that they can be more nuanced because I think there's a lot of... Uh, um, distance with this debate, uh, at least in as a part of our education. I think probably Solly can answer. That. Thank you. Okay, maybe we'll start with the first. 
On the uh, yeah, this is a concern which I did not mention with time. Yes, it is a concern that, uh, and it's more related to this whole inclusion exclusion thing. Is more related actually to the whole the whole push for conclusive titling. The debate is really acute there. That in this uh, mad rush to create a record in which there's one owner will trample on various kinds of rights which don't get reported and there will be mass scale exclusion in areas especially where records are poor or don't exist. This is a major concern when we, when we look at um, the, the quick application of technology to, to yield results of a particular, in a particular direction. So my view is that we need to be aware of this. And if we are concerned about it, then we must give our inputs in the designs, in the way the things will be structured, keeping in view the, fi the objective. It's very important to have a very clear perception of the objective. It's a comprehensive record which encapsulates all rights, all kinds of... Uh, all kinds of encumbrances, restrictions, conditions which are attached there too. And that's what I have to keep aiming at. It's, not it's going to be difficult, but it's a play of the same tensions and dilemmas and conflicts which play out in the larger sphere. So don't think of it. So the problem arises because we start thinking, no, I won't allow this because this is going to infringe and, and prevent certain people from, uh, or trample on certain people's rights. I think a better way of looking at it is, this is occurring. I have to find ways of ensuring those rights don't get trampled, not stop a process which is occurring even in the larger sphere of things. First point. Is land shifting in its shape? No, this, what is really happening is the ease and velocity of transactions is, is being enhanced. The markets in land are taking play, uh, are, are getting to be, uh, market forces are able to interact on land much more, right? The use of land in various ways is in, uh, 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 as collateral, as a productive asset is being enhanced. It's not changing its shape. It's just that it's finally about how how well are you able to transact in it? What is the ease? That's what is being aimed at in the current environment. And that's what this is enhancing or making easier. As I said, the substrata of concern will always be the same, that in pushing this idea of land being transacted more easily, being used better by owners, am I going to trample on rights which are which are also attached to this land by people who may not be formally easy for them to be incorporated as owners. They may be just users in a certain way. And how do I make sure that their rights continue to exist, have to be settled? The word in government would be usually that we need to settle rights. We need to capture rights and settle them. And that's the concern. Just to kind of clarify, um, when, when Deepak is suggesting a five kind of fold path, so to speak, uh, ownership, possession, land use, uh, classification, and encumbrances. So uh, as you move down that spectrum, perhaps that's what you allude to when you're saying it's becoming more. But this classification is not necessarily what the state uh, is comfortable with in the sense that, you know, because this is entering terrain which is getting into kind of gray area recording land use which is de facto but not de jure in the sense it's not legal but so that liquid so to speak as you're saying liquid terrain is actually not what the state's imagination of it yeah. what is happening is that land continues to be a commodity the, there is no experiential stuff which is being recorded you know so in, in from the architectural side but but what is happening is that transactions are becoming because it's the commodity, because land is back as a kind of, you know, in the scheme of things, especially in urban property, verticals a lot. 
Be so transactions are becoming a proxy for for the record and often people are even asking questions as to why do we need a record over and above the registration document which is if it is otherwise updated and has the relevant stuff and does e and what not why the need for anything more the need for anything more is also the exclusion question that uh, if you were to as in a blockchain situation uh, reduce the the even the commodity or the resource aspect of land only to transactions the large swathes of india uh, which are not transacting for multiple reasons some of it has to do with the classification of the land itself for example forest areas and what have you some of it is has to do with the economics around the land and speculation around it except or the lack of it so to speak uh, uh, some of it has to do with stuff like uh, caste relations etc where you know certain groups are are, are not in the scheme of things but the fact remains that this kind of focus on transactions does not by itself render the uh, the uh, the the looking of land itself as a liquid kind of thing the liquid which solid is talking about that, that liquid imagination of land uh, is not the imagination in so far as the recording of land rights are concerned or land on of the record is concerned but that's my point of view so yes sorry my just no very much uh, oh no that's right so i think the two ways of um, of also i mean uh, looking at it because uh, uh, i mean the two ways of interpreting your your question one is that the uh, it's a kind of a normative visionary kind of almost a le corbusian kind of question where you have the classic architect okay who's uh, trying to think of frozen music as it's been looked at and anything else that is there is a form of contamination and uh, the other way is that um, you take the complete opposite uh, spring to that which is also there in the uh, at least architecture urbanism literature where you have architecture without architects okay and a whole way of so a lot of um, squatter upgrading kind of stuff that came about in the 80s among uh, architectural practice it uh, is in india and in the other parts of south but in the 60s itself in uh, northern europe uh, was premised around this aspect of and it was went under various kind of rhetorics of community based architecture stuff like that the other stuff which if you um, talk to a lot of people especially in bombay but also elsewhere uh, you would be working with uh, various clients where you're not really that much bothered are they the owners or not you just know that they are occupants and if they have quote unquote, uh, quote unquote uh, in the master planning frame um, added three feet to their balcony or created a balcony by adding a three feet to their room uh, then if they have paid a compounding charge on that based on what the municipal regulation is then that's perfectly legal and then you just are basically designing the handrail or the kind of balcony that they want over there you're not bothered have they paid the compounding charge that's their business okay to take that even to a further extreme you may not as an architectural office even do the sanction plans yourself you may actually hire someone who used to who works or used to work in the municipal office to do that right because he or she would know how to frame the sanction plan you pass karwa denge and then you go ahead and do the quote unquote actual design so in terms of uh, the set of practices of architecture almost starting to mirror what's happening with various other government uh, uh, you know governmental authorities and systems and i was thinking of um, both the point what amlan said and also what uh, deepak said where he said the local bureaucracy think differently and i'll go to you and know the ground situation far better and often they know the policy also i'll give you a concrete example of this if and there's a particular time period also this this is 1995 shadra east delhi if you're talking about large amount of home based industries if you're talking about getting in some kind of services basic infrastructure through regularization they would say aapka factory jo hai it can be on the ground floor but if it is in the basement then it's going to be impossible to get a 11 hp connection under what's called a 
LCA. Now that's not the aircraft being created, but it's called a local commercial area, which the local body is designating as a new kind of master planning category. So just as in the case of Villapuram, where we had this new term called College Purumbok, okay, a wetland connected to college. Here you have a LCA coming, which is not in any of the master planning documents of the BD of the Delhi Development Authority. It's how very much of the both the Desu because they have to provide the electrical supply, they charge for it because they want safe transformers and they're making the grounds on public safety. Okay, and this is in the G D Vasant Committee report, who is the chairman of the uh, Punjab Electricity Board coming to review Delhi's unauthorized connections and he squarely blames the master plan. He said, you guys are irrelevant, you planners don't go to the field. Because of that, lot of public are put to unsafe connections and also they sues losing uh, revenue. Okay, so suddenly as an architect, that means your actual clientele and your system of how you're playing the administrative system is implicated in these uh, practices. This is very different from the earlier modernist schools of uh, how, uh, at least for a long time, because that's where I studied uh, SPA, and I don't know how SPA is teaching architecture, but it's kind of stuck in a quagmire or an older kind of fossilized system of frozen music type of uh, philosophy, which is completely wrong. Okay, according to me. Uh, just to make that point before we uh, take maybe a couple of points before we break for lunch, is that uh, in about 2002, I was asked by a, a group of uh, uh, both the ex-chief secretary and uh, someone who is connected to a very important whatever NGO in Bangalore uh, to help them think about the uh, master planning norms for Bangalore. Okay, and I walk in and there's another there's an architect there and uh, we just said, you know, uh, actually in Bangalore, as a lot of you know, you have revenue plots which are DC converted and a lot of them are really small because that's what people can afford. This is like 2000, 1998, 99, around that time. And uh, they said, oh, and they are in third block Koramangla. So you're already talking of a 30 by 90, uh, sorry, a, f a 60 by 90 plot, okay? And uh, I just said, you know, a lot of people are actually in like, uh, if you're lucky, f you know, 30 by 40, but otherwise something even less than that. And what they had interpreted, looking at the bylaws from Delhi and elsewhere, they said all bylaws have to have a 10 foot setback. I said, if you're going to have a 10 foot setback in a plot that is like 20 by 35, you know, variations of that and all around, you know, you, you can basically walk up and down on that plot and you can't do anything. And they thought first I was being sarcastic, which I was kind of saying, yes, I am. But the point is, that's the reality. The next question that came to me, uh, and this was by the person who headed the Bangalore Art, uh, Urban Arts Commission, or whatever it is called, is that how can people be allowed to live there? This is the actual quotation. How can people not, how can people be living there, which is the kind of dream, but how can people be allowed to live there? So I think th this kind of, a, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of sanctity of the bylaws is a serious issue if you take that as a given. You have to, rather it's a much more complicated negotiated process, uh, you know, which the world lives in. So uh, let's have a couple of more questions, otherwise we'll break for lunch, but, uh, you know, and put your questions to everyone, including people who have talked earlier, uh, I mean, from the audience, I'm not anyone. So, as you can say, it's a kind of a broader space. Uh, the table has, in fact, disappeared by now, which is not a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And if you have to Oh, no, I don't need to do that. Uh, I'm uh, Shishti and I'm a student of sociology. So this question uh, comes from a work which a PhD student has been doing in uh, my department. And uh, it was an interesting observation and sort of like pertains. And this is uh, about land grabs, right? Uh, so now all of this is about land possession and then like ownership of land. And on the other hand, what is happening there is that because there was a sort of uh, Un, uh, unsettling uh, 
uh, experience with the redistribution of lands uh, in 1971. Now what the CPI ML is doing, which is a left wing party over there, it's that it's taking over the right, I mean it's taking over this whole redistribution in its own hand. And it's sort of sovereignty in practice where they are redistributing the land by taking over by Dakhal. And that's what the local term is. And it's uh, in Bhojpur district, it's been seen as a a uh, feature of that party uh, and they don't need technology there, they, all they need is like a uh, uh, dakhal in terms of getting their ox and uh, all the landless and the poor are supposed to get land according to them and along so I'm thinking of this particular example alongside like technology about how can such records, uh, what happens to the records then, how, how can technology probably reflect on these kind of land grabs, when whether they can or cannot, uh, because if this is the situation on land where uh, sovereign has been sort of taken over by parties, political parties there, um, how can I understand this? And yeah, I think it's very simple. I mean, either you have a functioning state or you don't. That's all. Right? If you don't have a functioning state, it won't be record, then then. There's no point talking about a record. And there is no right of agreement. It may be recorded. There is a question talks about rights and conciliation, relationship with the ship, right? So I think you're there. If I sit on it, then I'm fine on it forever. But it's also in contested territory. Please use mics, please, for the live show. I mean, this is just one juncture. What you are talking about is there is a long history of this for which goes back at least even in organized resistance terms 50 years, no minimum. So, and it has had its ups and downs and it has had its caste relations, etc. So, what you are saying is one juncture where this is happening now, it is very well possible that six months on you will have the rival group kind of taking over the state doing something else, etc. Et so, in conflict zones basically, that is the. So, what the state would do is basically not record any of this when it is very in liquid form. In fact, if I go to parts of Bihar and Jharkhand, the record hasn't been updated since 1930s. So, I mean, in any case, there is no record of the contemporary. In 1930s, you can go back, there are instances, I know call friends, who have gone back to look for a record which belongs to their great-grandfather today is yeah, still recorded. It is basically on verbal record of education. It's not really like… Yeah. So, the, if, if you have a a sort of civilized functioning of systems, then rights would be getting recorded and would become something, even if you are not owner, you have occupied, you have got some rights, they start getting recorded. Not likely to happen yet there. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you all very much. I might also just suggest if you look at uh, the bigger hukum cultivation of land, I mean in parts of Karnataka and elsewhere, let me uh, allow you to uh, think of it in a very much more varied terms. So I don't want to eat into lunch time, sorry, no pun intended, <laughs> but uh, we close now and Vikas is pointing out yeah. several times to… <laughs> sorry, just Thank a couple of things. Amog's got an announcement over there. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to point out the work.